How many of you are thankful that God is your everything, your ever-present help in the time of trouble? I said, how many of you are thankful that God is your everything? Amen. We serve a good God. We serve a great God who can do anything but fail. You know, too often I think we take for granted the fact that God is for us. And if God is for us, then who can be against us. For too often, I think, we take for granted the fact that God is with us in times of trial, in times of testing, in times of storm, in times of when we need some clarity or understanding. God is present, our ever-present help in the time of trouble. Too often, I think, we take for granted the fact that God is our everything, that he knows the way we take, and he is with us through it all. There's a songwriter said, uh, God is a good God. God is a great God. He can do anything but fail. And he has moved so many mountains out of my way. Oh, God is a wonderful God. I love, I love that song because it, it doesn't list the amount of mountains that God has moved because there's so many to count. There's so many when we think back on the situations that we didn't think we could see an end of or situations that we didn't know how to get out of God just moved that mountain out of the way and there's so many of those it says that God can do anything but fail we serve a good God we serve a great God and I'm so grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning today I'll be coming from the book of Ephesians chapter 3 Ephesians chapter 3 if you have your Bibles you can turn with me you have your phones you can scroll with me whatever the situation to Ephesians chapter 3 I'll be starting uh, from verse 16 Ephesians chapter 3 excuse me from verse 14 Ephesians 3 verse 14 God is a wonderful God God is my everything it's in him we live in him we move in him we have being our identity. He is the source of our strength. You have it. Let me hear you say amen. 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 Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who was able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The title of this message is, I've Got the Power. I've Got the Power. Dear God, I just thank you so much for this time. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for how you love us. Thank you for how you're with us. I pray, Lord, that as I speak, Father, that you would have your way, that these words would find their home in good soil, Lord, that you would be glorified, that your people would be edified, that the enemy would be horrified, Father. I pray that you would hide me behind your cross, Lord. I pray that these words would have their desired result, Father, that you would convict, that you would encourage, that you would strengthen, that you would uh, be with us, Lord. I thank you. I praise you. pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Uh, before we dive into uh, just this text, I think it's important that we take a look at this book, Ephesians, and why it was written, who wrote it. Uh, it was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was in prison when he wrote this book. It was written to uh, the church in Ephesus, the Jews and the Gentiles that uh, came together to form a church in Ephesus. And it was written to show them pretty much what it means to be a Christian. Christianity 101, somewhat. 
Uh, it starts off, and, and we see that Paul didn't just wake up one day to write this. This was a process for him. Uh, in Paul's life, what we see taking place is that he was uh, uh, someone that was a, a leader uh, in the, the charge of persecution against the church. He was a leader in the charge of persecution against the church. So the early church was being persecuted for their belief in Jesus Christ. And Paul was one who took it upon himself to uh, be at the, the, the forefront of this persecution, an onslaught against the church. He was taking Christians and throwing them into prison and taking Christians and ripping them uh, f apart from their, their families and, uh, uh, because he, he, do, he was doing what he thought was right. But one day when he was on a road to Damascus, on this road as he was heading towards this way, the Lord interrupted him. God came and shone a bright light and Jesus said, he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul, Saul, why is it, why are you doing these things to me? And Saul realized then and there that he was persecuting the church of Christ, that he was in error and had to shift and change in his ways. And so from that moment on, he realized that uh, he had to have a dramatic shift and he changed his name from Saul to Paul and surrendered his life to Christ and to the ways and things of God. And what we see taking place is the Lord used him mightily. God said, you're going to be my ambassador. I'm going to send you uh, to do uh, missionary work. I'm going to send you to preach my gospel. I'm going to send you to start churches. I'm going to send you out to do my work. And so Saul becomes Paul and becomes one of the greatest uh, uh, evangelists for Jesus Christ that the world has ever seen. Writing the majority of the New Testament to different churches that he started or different churches that he's in fellowship with to correct different error. And we see Ephesians is one of these books that he's written. And it's pretty much Christianity 101, an introduction as to what it means to be a believer for this church in Ephesus. And uh, it talks about, in, in the opening chapters, it talks about there's two sections of having grace through faith. And that's how we have salvation and how that faith is applied in the body of Jesus Christ. And in this specific chapter, in chapter 3, uh, uh, Paul is saying that God has made known this mystery. There's a great mystery that, that the people uh, to whom he is writing, they're not aware of. And the mystery is this, that salvation is made to the Jews, is given to the Jews and the Gentiles. Now this is uh, maybe common knowledge to many of us, but back then in the time of, of this writing, uh, salvation was seen as something that was only given to the Jewish people. And Paul is saying, no, 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 it's not just extended to Jews. But if you read carefully throughout scripture, you'll see that salvation has been extended to Gentiles, those that are not Jews. And God has called us all to repentance and all to salvation in him. And in this section, Paul says a special prayer to those that he's writing to, that they would experience Christ in new ways. He says, look, this mystery is revealed that salvation is extended to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And my prayer for you is that you would experience the love of Christ, the reality of Christ in new ways. And what we get here when we read this scripture and we decide to drag and drop and apply it in our life to our context in 2019. What we get here, I believe, is a challenge, a challenge to us to understand that God is calling us, as I stated last week. To kill our comforts and to get out of our comfort zones, to get out of our comfort zones. As we leap into the last month of 2019, as we now you know, go through the, the holiday season and celebrate Thanksgiving, the next time we meet again in this sanctuary, it will be, it will be December the 1st. The service will be at 1115 and we will be here worshiping and fellowshipping together. But it's going to be the last month of 2019. And time marches on, and as time marches to the beat of its own drum, I believe that the Lord is challenging us to kill our comfort zones. I believe that the Lord is challenging us to love deeper. I believe that the Lord is challenging us to walk in power and walk in authority. I've got the power. Paul starts by saying, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. I bow my knees before the Father. We see that Paul is writing this letter from prison. He's in prison. He's not in a bed of comfort. He's not living in the lap of luxury. Paul is in prison writing this letter. 
And so what, what, what we see here is something that I've said before. Your posture in whatever season of life you are in is just as important as the season itself. And so oftentimes we get so caught up in the season of life that we're in. We get so caught up in, oh, the, the blessings are flowing and God has been good to me and this job has been wonderful and my family's doing great. And we get so caught up in this wonderful season or the flip side, we get caught up in the fact that things aren't going so well. Our money seems to be drying up. Our health seems to be poor. And we get so caught up on the season that we're in that we forget to examine our posture. We forget to say, are we surrendered? Are we submitted? Look at Paul's posture. He says, I bow my knees before the father. He is in prison, but yet he's praying. He's in prison, but he's not bitter. He's still doing the Lord's work behind the bars. Doing the Lord's work even as he's in discomfort. Doing the Lord's work. Paul is in prison and he's still humble. He's in prison and he's still submitted. He's, still pr he's in prison and he's still approaching the throne of God. But many of us, as soon as our, our, our situation changes and it doesn't look like things are going to work out our way, our posture shifts. And instead of us staying and remaining submitted, even though our circumstances shift, we harden our hearts and become bitter towards the things of God and run away from the God that blessed us. He was just blessing you a while ago. You were fine then. And now when, the, the, when things begin to shift, we shift as well. But no, no, no. Your posture and whatever season you're in is just as important as the season itself. And so we see Paul is in prison, but yet he is still praying. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the father, the father that's in authority. The father that holds my situation, my circumstance, and my world in his hands. The father that knows the outcome of the, se the season I'm in and how long this season has to be. For this reason, I submit myself to a higher authority. For this reason, I bow my knees before the father. From whom, verse 15, every family in heaven and on earth is named. So both the angelic hosts and the tribes of men alike. To both the angelic hosts and the tribes of men alike, God is Father. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is made. God says, look, I'm, I'm the starting point. I am the alpha and the omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the foundation. Through me, all things exist. Through me, all things come into being. God is the origin. He is the, the starting point. And we said what? God is, God is what? My everything. And that's why it's so important to understand that all these things come from him. All these things are held in his hands because when we stray from him to find meaning, identity, purpose, value, worth, anywhere outside of him, we're bound for heartbreak. We're bound for disappointment. We're bound uh, looking continuously lost from the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. Chasing something that God deposited within us. What? The desire and ability to turn to him and worship him. But yet we go from thing to thing, from person to person, from situation to situation, looking for meaning, looking for fulfillment, looking for identity, looking for purpose and worth. And God says, if it's not in me, then what good is it doing? If it's not in me, but you're only going to get but so far. Those things may satisfy for a moment, but in the end, you will be left empty. In the end, you'll be wanting to, to or desiring to figure out how to come back to me. So God says, I am the starting point. I am the origin. And, and then Paul says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being in your inner being for this reason i bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being what i think it's, it's important for us to see is that the strength is not through us but the strength is through his spirit the strength is through his spirit according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being through the through the riches of his glory through the riches of his glory this is the god that said let there be and there was this is the god that spoke all there is into being this is the god that gave us intellect 
This is the God that fashioned things and formed things into to being. Our God, we see, our God is, our God is never going to run out of resources. Because he is the source from which the resources come. Right? So the, the riches of his glory. So many times I feel as though we think we can sum up, okay, this is God's net worth. This is what he has. This is what's going on with God. No, no, no. It, 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 it's never going to run dry. This is a well that's never going to be depleted. This is a source that's never going to, to need uh, to be plugged in or charged. Through the, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you. This is the God that says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't, I would not have told you this. God says, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. You cannot comprehend the riches that God has, the power that he has. In the Bible, it describes some scenes in heaven, and it says that the streets are paved with gold. And that's just material. That's what we think of status is, oh, he has this much. And we think of it as, as, as a beautiful thing and it's wonderful. But that's just the material blessings. God is pure. God is righteous. God is holy. He is the prince of peace. He is joy. He is patience. He is the essence of what we pray for. And he is, as a result, the things that we uh, 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 go for, he possesses. Things that we go after, he possesses. So he has riches in glory. God, uh, Paul is saying that according to the riches of God's glory, God can grant you to be strengthened. He's not going to run out of strength to give because he is strength. He's not going to run out of peace to give because he is peace. He's not going to run out of joy for you because he is joy. According to the riches of his glory, have him strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Paul wants the Lord to strengthen us with what? Power through his spirit in your inner being. This power does not come through our own strength. This power does not come through our own might. This power comes through the spirit of God. Through the spirit of God. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, but you will receive power. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus is saying you will receive power, power, power to do what you think now is impossible. To be my witnesses. You're not going to be my witnesses and then receive power. You're going to receive power and that power will propel you to be my witnesses. The question is, are you willing to wait for the power? Jesus says you have to go to this upper room and you must wait. You will be endowed with power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's a process. Are you willing to wait through the process so the power of the Lord can show up? Many of us, we leave too soon without the power. And God is saying, look, I, I, I want you to have this power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And what, what's going to happen after this? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the ends of the earth. You will do what you think now is impossible in Jerusalem, in home, in your home. You'll be my witnesses. You'll shine as a light for those that you're comfortable with, those that you know very well. You'll shine as a light and you will be my witnesses in Judea to your friends and acquaintances and different individuals that may not be home in Jerusalem, but they're not too far off. You'll be a witness. You'll be a light. You will shine as an example to Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. Samaria, a Jew in this day and age, in this time, wanted nothing to do with Samaria or Samaritans. Wanted nothing to do with them. If, if the shortest distance from uh, where, where these individuals, where the, where the Jerusalem, if the shortest distance from Jerusalem to a specific place was through Samaria, they would go the long way. Just so they didn't have to go through the town because they were disgusted and didn't get along with these individuals. And yet Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Samaria. You will be my witnesses in the places where you don't think you can witness to, in the difficult places, and in the individuals that have been rude to you, in the, in the, to the individuals that have been unkind to you, to the individuals that have betrayed you. You will minister to them. You will be a blessing to them. How is that possible, God? Because you're not doing it in your strength. You're not doing it in your power. You're using my power in you to be an example and a light to those that have been unkind. To be an example and a light to those that you deem unworthy. 
Because you're not thinking with your strength. You're thinking with your thoughts. You're thinking with my thoughts. And you're walking in a way that I've called you to walk with my power, with my authority, and to the ends of the earth. This gospel is not going to just be taken within your comfort zone, but to the ends of the earth. It's going to go as far as it can go. That's where I've called you to. For us, some places the Lord is, is calling us to, some areas of ministry or some areas to minister in that the Lord is calling us to, we had absolutely no idea. We didn't think that the Lord would call us to minister at our workplace or call us to be an example uh, uh, in our school or call us to be an example in specific areas, the ends of the earth, places where uh, we didn't see ourselves. But yet the Lord, through his power, through his anointing, calls us, changes us, transforms us, and launches us to be witnesses. But how does this happen? Through power. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. You will see power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 says, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's the only way that this task will be accomplished, Zerubbabel. The only way this is going to be accomplished is by the spirit of the Lord. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And many of us are confused because we're putting forth all our effort, all our might, all our power, and we're coming up short. And we're wondering why, we're wondering what's wrong, we're wondering where, what we're missing. God is saying it's by the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit can these things come to pass. There are things that we've been hoping for, things we've been working for, things we've been striving for, and it's wonderful, it's great, and we're wondering what's going on. God is extending his arm saying, walk with me by my spirit and the thing will be accomplished. You've done all you can do, now see what I can do. You've done all you can do, now see what I can do. And there are things that we're praying for as a church, as a ministry. We just spoke about the glory of God. And, and that was a, a, a season that we were in and we're still in, praying for the glory of God. Praying for God to reveal himself in this place. Praying for God to move mightily. That's not, not going to happen because we will it to happen. That's not going to happen because we woke up on the right side of the bed this morning. That's not going to happen because we put some extra time in at the gym this week. That's going to happen by God's spirit, not by our effort. Not by our effort, by the spirit of God. So there are certain things that we may be hoping for, striving for, pushing for, that God says, turn down your plate and pick up my word. Turn down your plate and join the saints of God in prayer. Turn down your plate and, 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 and engage in a lifestyle that pleases me. It's not going to happen by might nor by power. But the door that you want to open will only open by my spirit, says the Lord. There's some places that God wants to take us. And it calls for us being free from our comfort zones. We have to remove ourselves from the comfort zones of life. And walk into the place that God has called us. Last week I, I spoke about that. How Jesus wanted to heal the man. But he took him away from his comfort. And outside of the city gates. So that he could do the work that he wanted to do. And many of us. We have to understand. We have to go by the spirit's leading. And we're too comfortable when God is calling us higher. We're too comfortable when God is requiring more from us. What this shows us is that when we are weak. When we are weak and when we let go. That's when we're truly free. When we understand how limited we are, that it's not in our strength, but it's through God's strength. That's when God shows up and does the work that he can only do. He gives us power for a reason. And what I love about this, 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 this specific scripture is that we are strengthened through, with power, through his spirit, in your inner being. In your inner being. Many of us... We're focused on the wrong thing. We're focused on the wrong thing. What did God say to Samuel when Samuel went to go anoint David as king? He saw his, David's, he saw his brothers parading in and said, surely this is the man. Surely this is the king. Surely this is the king. God says, no, 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 don't anoint him. Because I don't look as man looks. Man sees on the outward appearance. 
But it's God that looks at the heart. It's God that looks beneath the surface. We don't want just to have power in our physical bodies, but God wants to give us power in the inward man, power on the inside, power for a reason on the inside of us. And many of us, we look nice, we smell nice, we do all these different things to make sure our physical bodies are fine and that we uh, are gaining attention from individuals. But have you ever stopped to consider that perhaps you're wanting attention from the wrong people when you should be desiring attention from the true and living God? You're looking good for the wrong people when in fact the true and living God is looking at you saying you haven't dressed up for me in a while. When God is saying, I'm looking at your heart. What about the condition of your heart? I want to give you strength in the inward man and in the inward individual. I want to strengthen you. But you have to be in a place where I can give you this power and you're ready to receive it. Can't do this in our own strength. We can't change by might. We can't change by power. But we have to change by our spirit. By the spirit of the Lord. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Through faith. Now this is big because Christ wants to dwell in our hearts. What is on the seat of your heart? Because what's on the seat of your heart ultimately is going to come out. Luke chapter 6 says, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you'll get somebody or you'll have a time in your life when you'll say something. You'll say, I didn't mean that. But out of the heart, out of the abundance, the overflow of the heart, something you didn't plan on coming out comes out. You have more digging to do. You have more searching to do. You have more uh, becoming like Christ to do. Paul, uh, uh, Jesus says, abide in me in John chapter 15. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. So the question is, what are we doing? What are we doing? Are we accomplishing things? Apart from Christ, nothing can be accomplished. And so we see that Christ in the life makes a difference. Are we abiding in Christ? It's through faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things unseen. We have to look to Jesus, the text says in Hebrews chapter 12. The founder and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, in the midst of his circumstance, he did not want to go to Calvary's cross. He did not want to go to the cross. He said, Lord, if there's any other way, Father, God, if there's any other way to save these people, to save them, to bring restoration to mankind, if there's any other way, show me. If there's any other way, let this cup pass. But he had to take on the wrath of God so that we could be spared. He had to take on the full weight of the wrath of God so that we did not have to go through that. He had to take on the full weight of God's displeasure with our sin so that we could be saved and brought near. It says, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What's the joy? The joy was not the cross. The joy was what was beyond the cross. Beyond the cross was Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. Beyond the cross was the reception and the welcome party that they threw for Jesus when he entered in heaven's gates after he breathed his last on the cross. And they said, well done, you did this thing. Salute to you, our King of Kings. The, 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 the joy that's set before him is the redemption that we have as people that wanted nothing to do with God are now able to come before a holy God with clean hands and a pure heart because Jesus made the way for us. That was the joy that was in Jesus' heart. That was why he, he suffered through the lashes and suffered through the beatings and suffered through the crucifixion as they nailed him to the cross. Because of the joy that was set before him, it, it allowed him to endure the cross. It allowed him to go through something that he didn't think or that maybe we don't think was, was easy to go through. It allowed him to lay his life down and also believe that he could pick it up again. Because we see that Jesus did not stay on the cross. Jesus did not stay in the tomb. He is resurrected and seated at the right hand of the Father. And he didn't see this joy uh, physically, but before it took place, he had to understand and know that it was going to come to pass. So we have strength through the Spirit of God. We have strength 
through the Spirit of God. We have strength, not through our strength, but through the Spirit of God. So that's what we have to do. And the next, we have to search the depths of his love. Paul calls us to somewhat of a, a scuba diving expe expedition to, to search the depths of the love of God. He says that you being rooted and grounded in love, being rooted and grounded in love. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. It's not easy to be rooted. It's not easy to be grounded. But a tree that's deeply rooted stands firm when the storms come. A tree that's deeply rooted and anchored does not waver much when the storms blow their way. It's difficult to be rooted. You, just roll, don't, you don't just roll out of bed being rooted. It's difficult. If it was easy to love well, then everyone would do it. If it was easy to love your brother and sister well and love the Lord well, then, then everyone would do it. It's not easy, but it's possible because of the power that's ours through Christ Jesus. Love is patient. <clears throat> love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, nor is it irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away and I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part and then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these is love. This is a, a bit of a departure from the text. But this is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you've been to a wedding or another church service. You've heard this verse before. It's a common verse on, on the theme of love. And Paul wrote this as well. But he wrote it to an audience who was very uh, 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 proud of their gifts. Proud of what God gave them. They were able to speak in other tongues and prophesy and do all these things. And they were getting kind of full of themselves because of their giftings. And they weren't treating each other with kindness. They weren't treating each other with love. And Paul writes to them and says, look, it may be a wonderful thing that God gave you this gift, but where's your love? It may be a wonderful thing that God has blessed you with this and opened this door and done this and this and this. It may be a beautiful, wonderful thing, but if you don't have love, what are you doing? It's like a clanging cymbal. It's like a loud noise to God, a gong that he doesn't want to hear. Where is the love, Paul says. He says, right now we don't see fully, but later we will see it fully as, and we will become as he is. He says, look, when you were a child, you did things like, like you were a child because you were a child. But now that you're a man, why are we still acting in childish ways? If God has called us from milk to meat, if God has called us to grow up as Christians, to grow up as believers... And we need not to just walk in the gifts. That's fine. You can walk in the gifts. That's a beautiful thing. But God has called us to walk in love. In love. And he says faith is important. Hope is important. All these things are important. But they're rested and founded on love. It's a departure from the text. But it's necessary to convey how important this is. And what we are called to as believers. So we're called so we can be deeply rooted that we may have the strength, Paul writes, to comprehend with all of the saints, with all of the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is an overdose, an overflow to be filled beyond capacity. This is saying you need to crash and get rid of your comfort zones. You need to ask the question, how deep is your love? Have the strength to comprehend with all the saints. We're in unity here. The strength to comprehend what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I want you to know something that's unknowable. I want you to know something, to know the love of Christ. So that when you get a glimpse of it, you realize this is just the tip of the iceberg and there's so much more to know. 
There's so much more to discover. Our problem is we think, oh, Jesus died for my sins. That's great. He loves me. The Bible told me so. That's wonderful. And that's great. And that's truth. But there's, there's, there's um, another level of intimacy and depth that God is calling us to. There's another, another level of knowing who he is and being rooted in love, found in Christ, that he is calling us to. Paul prays that we may have the strength to comprehend what the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, to know the love of Christ. How do you know something that surpasses knowledge? So that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We ask, how deep is your love? But our problem is oftentimes we ask this question to the wrong people. We ask this question to people that hurt us, to people that use us, to people that leave us. And that's why we end up oftentimes with shallow, empty connections. But why don't we turn that question around and ask God? God, how deep is your love? And he will show you nothing can separate you from my love, my child. My love never fails. I'll keep meeting your needs again and again and again and again. I am your provider. I am your protector. I am your keeper. I am your sustainer. I keep you in your right mind when you thought that you would lose it. I blessed you when you didn't deserve it. I took you back when I knew that you would leave me. I disciplined you to bring you closer. And I sent my flawless son to die in the place of a sinner who wanted nothing to do with me. My flawless son, my spotless son, I sent him to die so that you might live. And that's just the beginning. Our problem is over time, we stop asking this question. Over time, we cease asking. We stop seeking. We depend on others for our motivation. We live guided by our feelings instead of our faith. We depend on others for our motivation. If you're coming in here on a Sunday morning and you're relying on the music and the worship of the team and myself preaching and just the way that the whole service is orchestrated. And you're relying on that to motivate you. You've got it wrong. You've got it wrong. Now, I'm not saying that we don't go through life, difficult seasons, difficult times when we need a push. But if this is your, your, your constant, your consistent. And you can't find time within the week to engage in the spiritual principles that are being taught over the pulpit. And you can't find time during the week to maybe turn down your plate and fast or open up the Bible and read what God says to you about you. And you're coming in here saying, okay, motivate me, motivate me, motivate me, and expecting this to last throughout the week. What the Lord is doing in here and wants to do in here is, is, is as much a, a partnership as anything. Yes, we come pre prepared to exhort and to lift up the name of Jesus, but... It's also on you to come prepared and move from the milk to the meat. There's a season for coming and saying, there's a season for coming in the house of God and saying, okay, motivate, motivate, like motivate me and help me to, you know, push forward. And we have those seasons. We have those dry spells when we're looking for something to engage and to, to push us forward. But every single, every single week, what we need to do is engage in the things of God throughout the week so that this is a, an addition, a boost to what's going on. And we may, and this may confirm some of the things that you maybe have gone through in the week. And because you've held on to what God has told you, because you've been a student of the word, because you've been in worship and been in prayer. The Lord is saying, look, I know the enemy was trying to knock you out this week, but I've got an extra boost for you to make it into the following week. And the following week and the following week. So God has called us to move from milk to meat. God has called us to move from, from a, 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 a being a child to putting away childish things and to being who he has called us to be and to, to realize, okay, even if Sunday is four days away, I can still be motivated because the same God that's with me in church on Sunday is the same God that's with me in the midst of this situation. And so I have my own ears. I can listen to this worship music. I have my own eyes. I can open up the text and say, God, speak to me in the midst of my situation I'm not just going to wait to hear it from the pastor or the team. I'm going to engage in the spiritual principles through the week so that when I get to the house of God, you're supposed to enter with thanksgiving. You're supposed to enter with praise. How can we do that if we're waiting for some sort of push? So we need to shift our thinking. It starts with a renewed mind, saints of God. 
We need to shift our thinking. And so the interesting thing about love, Paul says we need to know the love, the height, the depth, the breadth of love. And it's interesting because the interesting thing about love is sometimes you don't feel it. What do you do in those storms when you don't feel God near? When you don't feel the love of God? What do you do? You have to have faith. You have to trust. God says, look, even though sometimes you may not feel it, my love is not abuse. It's not betrayal. My love is not given to you to use you. My love is not given to you to take from you. My love is given to you for you. Take the time out and search. Take the time out and dig or do what David said. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see if there be any wicked way within me and then lead me in the way everlasting, which means if you find a wicked way, don't leave me where you found me, but redirect me and guide me in the way everlasting. So we can search for God just as God is searching us, but we need to open up that door. And so in this next season, we need to understand that God is calling us to take the hard steps to search his love, to read his book. And see what he's saying about us, that we are the head and not the tail, that we are more than conquerors. See what he's saying about us, that we are loved, that he has his name written on the palm of our hands, that nothing can separate us from his love. See what the Lord says about us. See what the Lord says, not just about you, but about himself, that he's not a man that he should lie, that his word will not return to him void. See what the Lord says about his church and about people that he's used in scripture. To fulfill the things that he desires through his power. And if he's used them, what is stopping him from using you? If he's used these people that are wrapped in flesh, what is stopping him from using you? These are examples for us to learn from, to glean from, to say, God, if you use such and such, you can use me. And it doesn't mean you have to be up here with the microphone. It doesn't mean you have to go out and be go on a preaching circuit, be an evangelist. God can use you in your sphere of influence. God can use you in whatever area you make yourself available to be used in. We just need to be responding to the power that he's offering. So we we need to read his book. We need to pray with his people. Many of us, we go through this Christian walk as if we're lone rangers, as if we're on this lone road all by ourselves. when God calls the believer to unity. That's why it's so important to get in the house of God. And if it's great, you're streaming and you're watching on YouTube and watching on Ustream. That's a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful thing. But we're also called to not neglect the fellowship of the saints. God has called us to worship and fellowship with one another in context. Why? Because you can only get so much from the other side of a screen. God calls us to pray for one another, to lift up one another, to grow together in unity. So pray with someone as well. God's called us to also lift up one another's burdens. Pray for someone else other than yourself, other than your needs. He's called us to fellowship. He's called us to give, to help help advance the needs of the church. He's called us to serve in different ways, in different capacities. And he's called us to love. He's called us ultimately to love. Third and finally, we need to stop limiting God. Take the limits off. Take the limits off. Take the limits off. Paul closes with this. Now to him who is able. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. All that we can ask or think. According to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. If there is no power, then there is no work. If there is no power, then there is no work. God, in the word it says that that the Lord is faithful when we are faithless. And so he cannot deny himself because he is faithful even when we are faithless. And if there's no power, if you're faithless and God is still faithful, then you're living off of favor. You're living off of grace, off of mercy, off of provision, off of God's faithfulness. But it may confuse you and you may think, okay, I'm doing good. I'm doing fine. When in in actuality, you're walking in faithlessness, but God is just being faithful. Let's not neglect the the, the tug at our heartstrings that God may have. When God is saying, look, I need you to be faithful in this area. I need you to get back in this area. I'm still going to provide because I'm faithful even when you're faithless. Even when you drop the ball, I'm still going to come through. So we need to understand 
that oftentimes we are limiting the power of God because we're not giving him ourselves to work with. Why is this important? Paul says, now who is now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. Mainly we hear this verse and we say, oh, yes, God's going to do it exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. God's going to do it. He's going to come through. God's going to do more. God's going to do greater things, greater things. That's true. But it says what? According to the power that's at work. Where? In us, not outside of us. In us. Which means we now are responsible to partner with God in doing exceedingly and abundantly. We're not just going to sit back and the exceedingly abundantly happen, but God wants to work within us to, to make that happen. Those things that we're praying for, God says what? I want you to write the vision and make it plain. The vision is for an appointed time, but you need to be the one to write it down. You need to be the one to write out those goals, write out these strategies, write out these things. And then we often do these things and we sit back like it's going to come to us. God says, no, no, no. I want to work within you, but you have to give me access to give you that power. You have to be willing to respond to the truth of the gospel and walk in the ways of the gospel so that I can have uh, uh, access to you. And if I do these things, then, then I'll do far more abundantly than we can ask or think. He's able to do it, but are we tying his hands? He's able to do it, but are we putting limits on God? To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, which means that God wants to be glorified throughout all generations. Through my grandfather's generation, to my father's generation, to my generation, to my son's generation. From generation to generation to generation to generation, God wants glory. And he wants to use his people to give him glory. And he wants to use his people to bring other people to him. We serve a God that sits high but looks low. We serve a God that deposits all of himself into, into jars of clay so that we could give him glory. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the power may be of God and not of us. God calls us to power. The beautiful thing about Jesus is he deposited his life, all he had within three and a half years, to 12 men. And he did not have a perfect success rate because one of them betrayed him. So even Jesus did not get 100 on, on this particular situation, right? Out of the 12, one of them betrayed him. But he still deposited everything he had all that he was, into the 11. So that when he departed, he said, look, I'm leaving you physically. I'm not going to be here for you to see, for you to touch, for you to laugh with and joke with. I'm not going to be here anymore, but I'm not leaving you totally alone. I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit. And this is why you wait with power. This is why you wait for the power, because when you uh, wait for the power, then the power will come. And I'll do what only I can do and turn the world upside down through you as believers. And so lastly, very quickly, as I, as I sum this up, we're all hoping that things work out for us and that things are good, but we need to understand that it all hinges upon what we sow and what we're sowing. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What, when, whatever one sows, that will he reap. For the one who sows in the flesh will reap the flesh, but the one who sows in the spirit will reap eternal life. So don't go weary in doing well, because in due season we'll reap if we do not give up. Many of us have been planting and planting and planting and planting and watering and watering and watering. And we don't realize that time of reaping is coming. And it's interesting because uh, 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 we serve a gracious God, we serve a loving God. But our God is able to do all that he desires to do in our lives. We just have to be surrendered enough to give him the power. Oftentimes, we're too comfortable, and that's why there's a lack of growth. We're too comfortable, and that's why there's a lack of change. We're called to shake ourselves out of our comfort zones and move in the direction that God has called us to. The Lord has not called us to be weak believers. The Lord has not called us to be weak Christians. The Lord has not called us to walk this in our own strength, walk this walk in our own strength. But the Lord has called us to a life of searching in his love, a life of love. A life without limitations, a life of authority, so that in this season, through highs, lows, peaks, and valleys, we can say, look, I know that I have the power. Let's give the Lord some praise. Let's give the Lord some praise. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. Don't let, the, don't let the enemy lie to you. Saying this is as far as you'll go. Saying that he's stronger than you and this is, you know, your lot in life. God has called you to have power, to have authority. So if you're here and you realize I've believed the lies of the enemy for too long and that's why I am where I am. I believe the lies of the enemy for so long and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because he's told me this is all I'm going to be. He's told me this is as far as I'm going to go. He's told me. And I've believed it, and this is how I've been living. And I want to make a, 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 a shift. I want that power. I want that power. If you realize I've been comfortable for too long. I'm a believer. I'm a son of, do- I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. But I've been comfortable for, for too long. And I want to get out of my comfort zone so God can move. I want to open myself up more. I've been closed off to God in some areas because I know it's going to require some sacrifice. But I'm a, I'm a believer, and I, I, I love Jesus. But I know he's calling me higher. He's calling for more of me. And I want that strength to accept that power. I'm just going to pray for you. Dear God, I thank you so much for your sons and your daughters. I thank you for those that know you, for those that are walking with you. I've come against the lies of the enemy, Father, that they maybe have believed that have caused them to only stay at one particular place. I pray that you would give us the strength, Father, to walk higher. To walk higher, to live higher. To do what it is that you have called us to do. I thank you for the power that is ours for the taking. That you give freely, Father. I pray, Lord, that we would not listen to the lies of the enemy and that we would uh, not walk in the ways that uh, displease you, Father, but that we would please you as sons and please you as daughters. I pray for power, Lord. I pray for power in our lives, Jesus. I pray for power in our lives, Jesus. You know what we're up against, Father. You know what we're facing, and I pray for power for each life here, each person here, each son, each daughter here, that we would get to, to know you better, to have more intimacy with you, Father. And that as a result, your power would flow through us, Jesus. We thank you. We love you. We praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Now, if you are here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you haven't prayed and asked for forgiveness of your sins, and you're still living in your own way, your own lifestyle, and you want to come back to Jesus today, if that's you, you want to make a stand for Jesus, you want to say, you know what, my life is, is, I've been doing things my own way and I want to come to Jesus today. I want to make a switch. I want to make a change. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Is there anyone here today that says, that's me, I'm in need of a savior. I'm in need of, a, I'm in need of Jesus Christ and I want to come to Jesus today. Maybe you were doing your own thing, but over time, uh, maybe you were once walking with Christ, but over time you decided to do your own thing, go your own way, and you want to come back to Jesus. If that's you, if, you're, if you uh, just want to come back to Jesus today, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Is there anyone here? All right, everyone standing, please. Everyone standing. Perhaps you're here and you're unsure of where you would go if the Lord were to call you from here into eternity. Or if the Lord were to crack the sky and come back. The word says he's coming back in in the twinkling of an eye. He's coming back like a thief in the night. We're not going to expect it. No man knows the day or the hour. He could come back at any moment. And so if you're unsure of where you would go, if your breath were to either leave you or the Lord were to come back. And you don't know if you would be with Jesus or be separated from him. And you want a blessed assurance. You want to know that you know that Jesus is yours. If that's you, if you're unsure, I would ask that you remain standing. But if you are sure... I'm going to ask you to take your seats. If you're sure of your salvation, take your seats. If you're unsure and want prayer, please remain standing. All right. Dear God, I thank you so much for your sons and daughters. Be with us as we move from here throughout the week. We thank you and praise you for who you're calling us to be, for the power that is ours through your son, Christ Jesus. We thank you and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. everyone could please stand. Thank you.